Hello there and welcome to another episode of Temporary Australians. I'm Jonesy. I'm Hirsty. Action-packed show today. Greg, it's good to see that you brought one of your modern bikes along. I thought you'd like it, mate. Actually, we're going up to Tamworth to look at the motorcycle scene up there. It's a brilliant motorcycle region and one of the things we found was a museum with a lot of old bikes. I love that museum. It's excellent. Absolutely brilliant. Also coming up on the show today... We check out some amazing art in Perth and find out about Red Circle Riders. Jonesy meets up with a bike called Dangerous Dave. The vigilantes talk about their club history. We find some hidden treasure in Hobart and check out the great race origins in Melbourne. I discover a show trike and a Catch-22 with overseas helmets. An HDTV band Screaming Eagles light up the stage. People come to Tamworth for the Country Music Festival or to see a rodeo. Well, this weekend there's a whole heap of bikers in town that are doing something completely different. It's a big weekend, a lot of motorcycle riders in town. Mate, Greg, have a look at this thing. It's unreal. I think by this afternoon, two and a half thousand. Mate, we're getting smashed in the workshop. The boys have done a brilliant job. Tamworth's a bit central. Bucket's Way, Thunderbolt's Way, uh, the, the drop off from Tannerfield down through the coast is good roads. So to come down here, I think a lot of people have been through this area before. Uh, it's big for bikes, there's bikes everywhere. Well, I did notice there's a number of motorcycle shops and a number of motorcycle brands in town. So is Tamworth a regional centre for motorcycling? It, it is, and as you go further west from here, you, you get more sparse. Is Triumph proving popular here? Great brand of motorcycle. Uh, great alternative to, to Harley Davidson. It, it's a it's a niche it's a it's a niche brand. It's it's a quality brand of motorcycle. It's interesting that there's a multi-franchise development in Tamworth. That seems to have worked in other regional centres too. And I think that's probably a good thing for motorcycling that you get a range of alternative bikes that people can choose. Yeah, it's great. And the future for the for the motorcyclists in Tamworth is is terrific. I mean, we're we're about to uh, am amalgamate two big stores in the area with a lot of history all into the one building so if you're a motorcyclist in this area you're in for a treat. Let's talk a bit about um, your impressions of the museum. I understand that's a private enterprise but it's also proving very popular. Fantastically laid out, fantastically done, great staff, a lot of history, knowledgeable staff, great place to visit. Good thing for Tamworth. You've got a lot of people who uh, come in today to have a look uh, from the Hog Rally. You must be pleased that it's brought a lot of motorcycling people to town. Well, I've been up here for eight years and uh, it's the busiest day I've ever seen here. So it's been an incredible day. People love to get out to ride. What a great location, Tamworth. Um, you know, it's, it's very central location from Victoria, South Australia, from Queensland, from all over Australia we've had riders come in. So, um, you know, we're just here to have a good time and, uh, and have a great ride on the way. What's been the reaction in the local community? Fantastic. I mean, the local council have been great to work with. Uh, you know, the people from ALAC Centre here have, have been just wonderful. Um, the police and, and all the local community, they, they just love it. They're like, they're already saying to me, can you come back next year? It's always a good sign. Are you surprised how big an event this has turned out? Uh, we've had wonderful support from our volunteers through to our hog chapters to through to our staff. So to say I'm surprised, probably not. You know, I've been very, very happy with the execution and everyone's enjoyment of the event so far. Yeah, the buzz around here has been very, very positive, and I think there's a great deal of encouragement that the numbers are up, because uh, in other areas of the motorcycle community, there's been a bit of a contraction, but it, it does seem to me that these sorts of events are really the future of the motorcycle culture. I think these, this is about the customer experience, right? So this is touching our motorcycles, this is seeing our general merchandise, feeling our PA and you really having an experience with others, you know, of like mind. So I think, yeah, these, these, this is definitely part of our brand and this is really where a lot of our future lies. Well, nowadays it seems that tattoos have got broad acceptance in the community and it's also become an art form too. Some of the designs are just quite remarkable. Oh, it blows me away. Uh, having done an art degree myself at school, and seeing where the, uh, some of the work, I was looking at one the other day, a three-dimensional tattoo on this guy's back. He sat there for nearly six hours just on one of the stands. And uh, the more I looked at this tattoo and looked into it, it was becoming three-dimensional. Here there's a celebrity uh, tattooist, Seth Onslow, from Krusty Demon. So I think when celebrities like that are, are, are doing it, it becomes more acceptable and, and more people want it. I watched him do a tattoo on a young guy's leg over the weekend. It was a picture of a Harley-Davidson engine. 
and the guy tattooed it on the top of his thigh and uh, he actually got him to sign it with his initials and then tattoo it into his leg. So the guy's got a Harley Davidson engine on his leg for life and uh, tattooed by one of the legends. It is amazing to see the intricacy that some of these artists are doing and especially in the portrait art. Like the, I mean, you're looking at a photo on someone's leg. That's how good these guys are in terms of the detail and their lines and all those sort of things. Yeah, it's certainly more socially acceptable and uh, having experienced that myself from uh, being drawn into that sector, oh, you've got tattoos, so you must be one of these or one of those, whereas now it's socially acceptable. Uh, certain jobs, they allow tattoos. Even talking to a surgeon the other day and uh, he got full sleeves, but to look at the guy, you wouldn't think he'd, uh, he'd fit the profile of having a tattoo, so certainly more socially acceptable. You don't have to be a badass bikey dude to have tattoos. One little Indian, two little Indian, and well, actually, just one Indian I've seen so far. G'day, Mick, how are you? Yeah, great, thanks. Look at this, how great is this? I always wanted one, and um, I couldn't ever afford to buy one that was running, so I bought this one that was smashed. So the whole front end of it was smashed, and we repaired it, and that's how I got into it. So what sort of work did you have to do when you say it was smashed? How, how bad was it? Uh, the tanks were, the tank was smashed in. The whole front end was smashed. Front wheel was buggered. The handlebars were all bent. Um, the guy that had it before me hit a Holden in the National Park. Dangerous Dave. Da is Dangerous Dave okay? Yeah, he's still right. He's, he's, he's hung up his lever, but he's still, he's going all right. But you're keeping the legacy going. Yeah, yeah, I'm not, just don't ride as crazy as like Dangerous Dave, hopefully. So, now, to ride these, like you've got the foot clutch, you've got, there's a whole rigmarole to... to yeah, to... it's different. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's so what like you... an anti-theft device, really. Right. So if you can ride it, you can, you, you can, you can yeah. steal it. And you'll find some Indians, people buy them, and then they can't ride them, so they'll, they'll on sell them again, you know? So, so how hard is it to ride? What do you have to do to get going? Uh, this is our advance and retard. You can see it moving the distributor there. So oh, yeah, it's yeah. advance and retard. Your throttle's over here. And the good thing with an Indian throttle is that you don't, it doesn't spring back. So you've got cruise control. Right, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good thing. Yeah, um, your clutch is over here and your gear sticks here. Right. right. So the starter, you'd be in neutral, clutch back, kick it, that should run. It runs good. Like a peach? Yeah, yeah. Good and something that's 75 year old, it's going all right, eh? And do you ever get confused between like retarding uh, it? And... You just become part of it. You know, it's, it's, I've got a few different old bikes and this one's just the most fun to ride, really. I can listen to that all day. Yeah. Thank you, Mick. Thank you. The Red Circle Riders Motorbike Club was actually formed two and a half years ago here in Perth with myself and a fellow who's a motorbike instructor. And we meet every second Tuesday night and we go for a ride to a hotel or a restaurant. Uh, our patch here has a 60 on it, which means speed limit only rides. If it says 60, we only do 60. So it's for new riders, uh, beginner riders, learning night riding and group riding, and to meet other motorbike riders. I'm glad you explained that, because I, I did think when I looked at it that maybe you have to be 60 to join it. I thought, oh, I just made it. No, 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 no. <laughs> we have all ages. We have 18-year-olds, and I think our oldest member is about 69. So there is some people in their 60s in the group. Uh, we do local rides as well. Also, seven of us recently went over to Vietnam, which was a, a big, exciting adventure for all of us. We're here at Victor Harbour with Bruce. He's found the perfect trike to take to the drive-in. Mate, you look pretty comfortable there. <laughs> yeah, it is comfortable, front or back. <laughs> Tell us about your trike. Uh, I bought it uh, 12 months ago. I had a, uh, a manual one before this one and uh, upgraded to the automatic. And uh, yeah, October last year I got it. I've done 18,000 Ks on it so far and thoroughly enjoy it. Now tell us about the custom paint work. It's very striking. I've always liked the Indian theme. And went and approached uh, Wayne Harrison at Advanced Airbrush in Penrith to, uh, to do the job for me. And a lot of the inspiration is his work. Well, it's all his work, of course, and uh, a lot of his design, which is spectacular. 
you gave him the basic idea and he just went with it. I said, you, you, you go for it, you're the expert at the painter. And uh, he's this excellent result. We notice a lot of people standing around looking at you. find that at shows, you get a lot of interested spectators? Oh, this is the first time I've had it out. Uh, I've only had it back together for approximately two months. So this is the first time that anyone's really had a really good look at it. But yes, it does create a bit of interest. Tell us about the Vigilantes. How did you start out? Well, we started out um, in 68. There was an original lot before us and um, we went and saw them when they had finished because quite a few, a few of them went across to the original Angels. They gave us uh, their, all, their, their best will to carry on the name, so we're still here today. What sort of things did your club do in those days? A few of our guys started racing, uh, road racing. So it was the main uh, uh, cause of the club at the time, and a few weekend runs away and that sort of thing, and a bit of drink and that, you know, like all the clubs do. Well, Angry Anderson was actually involved as a young man, I believe. He was, yeah. He was, um, he was in the club for the first uh, six to 12 months. To this day, um, I'm still associated with him. I've, I've sort of come back and been re-associated with him. But I, music was drawing me away from motorcycles. But you know, I've kept in touch and you know, that's been, like I said, with my, you know, with Rose Tattoo. Our association with uh, bikers and clubs and whatever over the years has been, you know, it's been synonymous with the band. Well, that's the early days, Dane. Yeah. Um, things have grown since then. Yeah, a lot of things have grown since those days. Um, there's been a hell of a lot of more, more clubs uh, that have formed, because back in our day, I think there was only, um, there was about four around back then. That's, a, that's about it, yeah. Mm. Have you been a patch club all your history? Yes, we have, but um, we didn't actually start wearing a back patch till probably around uh, 1969, 70. A family very important to your club? Oh, it is, yeah. We're very family orientated and we, we will be having a few of the, we're usually with the good weather coming on, we have a couple of family days, one down the Coburg Lake usually and one at the club, yeah. So uh, a couple of big days coming up to Christmas, yeah. Now, I noticed uh, last year at the Independent Riders Group seminar that a lot of your club members came along and it was very clear that your club wants to get politically active, particularly with the anti-association laws coming into the state. Those laws, I don't know, they're pretty hard to sort of understand at the moment because um, we're just seeing how things pan out, I suppose. We're at the tail end of our motorcycling lives yeah. um, and we're just seeing this now, but the people who have grown up in it, I think, uh, They've really got a battle ahead of them to turn this sort of thing around. It's going to be pretty hard, I'd say, yeah, because, um, well, you say, getting too political. Yeah, it is. Now, this Lambretta has a bit of a, an interesting history, mate. You found it under a house, I believe. Yeah, well, actually, I was at the bike show and um, I saw it uh, advertised uh, just by the form of a photograph on a trike. And I made some inquiries and subsequently went to look at the bike and, uh, and subsequently again bought it. But it took me about a year to get everything um, as I wanted it at the time. How long did it spend under the house? It was over 30 years under this particular, uh, the former owner's house, over 30 years. The bike's now 47 years old. Did you ever find out why he just put it there? He wanted to save it for his grandson when he became of age. But uh, unfortunately the grandson didn't share the, the same sort of uh, passion that the likes of me does and uh, wanted to offload it. Apparently he owed about $150 or so to a guy, couldn't pay him back and ended up giving him the scooter to pay off the $150 debt. I ended up purchasing it for $600 and it's currently worth anywhere between seven and 8000 Have you had to invest much to restore it to this condition? Well, quite considerably, I'd say, because the um, the paintwork was two, and bodywork was two thousand dollars back in 1996, uh, and um, of course lots and lots of uh, chroming, uh, sourcing rear accessories, and uh, general maintenance. Really, yeah. So I do have to ask you: Are you reliving your youth? I suppose, in some respect, yes. As soon as I was 16, bang, I got my first Lambretta, and I've loved them ever since. Tell us about the Harley versus Indian ride. Harley versus Indian, um, 
the great race, uh, Peter Arundel and I uh, came up with that idea in, I think, 1993. And uh, to rekindle that Harley-Indian rivalry, and of course there was no modern Indian then, uh, like it's been reinvented in the last couple of years, and the rivalry was very much like Holden and Ford. So we started a, a loose competition called the Great Race, and it started with a half a dozen Harleys and a half a dozen Indians riding from Brighton to Portsea. And over 25 years, it has ended up that it's about 130 bikes, 65 Harleys and 65 Indians on quite um, well-controlled time trials, and rolling races and a series of events over a weekend. Uh, and it comes up with a winner at the end of it, Harley or Indian. I've been in uh, two of them already. Yeah. So it's Indian versus Harley. You get about 150, 180 bikes. Uh, the next one's going to be on in Tasmania. So let's hope Indian win that one next year. You know, Harley won last year. So that's cool. Yeah, I'm looking forward to going in there. The great race continues. Thank you, Mick. Thank you. Just recently in Victoria, they've now made it legal for riders to, um, to buy and use uh, European standard helmets. Has that been a good thing? Yeah, well, the ECE, the ECE standard um, change is, is an important one. It's now legal in Victoria, as it is in Queensland, to use the ECE regulation improved helmets. But it's a sorry state of affairs because um, it's not actually legal to sell them in Victoria. I remember a movie called Catch-22. <laughs> it sounds very similar, Richard. Yes, you can have them, but you can't actually buy them anywhere. That's right, that's right. Um, and it, it's, it's symptomatic of the um, nature of helmet regulation, not just here in Victoria, but Australia-wide. It's really is an absolute dog's breakfast, and it still is the case. Other problems um, that, that the riders face is the uncertainty as to whether or not they're able to use a tinted visor, for example, and or whether they're able to um, legally have a, a helmet camera. Um, attached to their helmet. Well, that's interesting because they're both very popular. Visors, you see them all the time and, and it's very common these days for riders to have a camera mounted, not just so they can remember the ride, but also in case there's any law enforcement issues. Yeah, absolutely. I see them as both um, very important safety initiatives. Safety conscious riders, um, as most are, and mm. good risk managers um, are using visors and are using cameras to mitigate risk and avoid risk um, and they're being penalised for it. Steve, you've been to these sorts of events for a while now. What's your impression of the hog rallies? I love the hog rally. Well, last year we went to Cairns and uh, there wasn't as many people as there is here in Tamworth, obviously from where it, you know, a lot further to go to, but it was, um, this is great. And I was just think, you know, this many people to get together and they're all happy, they're all having fun, they all ride. It's fantastic, love it. And they seem very committed to riding. You get people from all over the country That's coming good. to this. They do, they do lots and lots of Ks. We just rode from Tasmania to, to Tamworth today, just got here, whole band, we all rode here, raised some money for charity and um, and, and our show, but yeah, you know, lots of hoggies pass us, we pass lots of hoggies, but they're all coming to the same place, which is good. Now tell us about the fundraising you're doing. We set up a thing called Brighter Days Foundation and we raise money for sick kids. We've got a bike festival on, which is uh, next week actually, where we draw a raffle. Last year we did a, um, we gave away a breakout, two tickets to stir, just a couple of grand cash, and uh, some fella from Darwin won that. Now besides being mates and riding together and raising money for charity together, you're also in a band together. Yeah. I bought a new rush more. I had a choice of four. We've all been in the music scene in Melbourne. Basically, that was our hobby, which was our full-time job. We've owned pubs, we've, so we've always been um, in the in the industry, in the entertainment industry, which is pretty much for television as well, you know. So yeah, and we've played, and now we've built, you know, we put this band together, the Screaming Eagles, and we're travelling around to dealerships and playing. We did. Uh, Fraser's 60th birthday party last night and uh, packed up the truck, grabbed the bikes and we rode here today, so it's great. I grew up in Whittlesea with uh, Dundo and we rode dirt bikes as kids and then uh, sort of progressed to the Harleys uh, probably 10 years ago. A lot of the stuff we're doing in this is Eagles based and, and then we sort of couple it with party songs and things like that. If we're going to ride and play music, I said I'm in, uh, you know, 
I'll just I'll just cancel stuff just to, to, to make it. You can't get more fun than riding around on a motorbike and hopping off and doing a gig. It's, it's just good fun, you know? And that's the main thing about it. But for us, it's fun. What a great show. I can't believe we're finished again for another episode of Temporary Australians. You know what I like about this bike, Hursty? What, mate? I love the belt on this thing. How good is it? It looks like a real belt, doesn't it? It does. You could wear that. Absolutely. I don't know, I don't know if it matches your outfit. You no, might, not today. You're more of a black, a black belt guy with I that outfit, so, yeah. I think, Greg. Yeah. We'll be back again next week with another episode of Temporary Australians. Check us out, temporaryaustralians.com.au. See ya. <laughs>